Oh, welcome again. Uh, the second part of the, of the lecture on the figure of, uh, of jumping um, that starts with the idea of the window, um, a window not so much in a wall, though we're speaking about, we would be speaking about walls or windows next to walls. Um, this is a, a, a mostly uh, a window in time, so we'll be seeing uh, 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 many different variations of this. Um, here we see the two that we left uh, in, in the first part of the of the lecture on jumping. On the right, Derrida, uh, his his, uh, his illustration for Parergon. Um, Parergon now taking over the work of the ergon, of the of the structure of the frame. And on the on the left, we see Dali waiting for something. We see him waiting for something uh, with an empty frame hanging from an easel. Um, and uh, this 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 empty frame is a uh, well. That's a, it's a window of opportunity or the window in time. Um, opportunity, this beautiful word, um, which is derived from port, uh, which is an opening port to the open sea. Uh, again, a sort of naval association in relationship to the gap. First, we we spoke about room and. Uh, room as a, as, a, as a Raum, as a, the hold of a ship, as well as the open sea or the open field. Um, so this is the, the big question is, of course, um, what is this opportunity? And what is especially this opportunity when we speak about painting? Because he seems to be starting to paint, but there's also a photo. And, uh, and um, we we're talking a lot about photography and uh, how photography relates to uh, to the to the to the idea of uh, of opportunity. Um, let me see the next one because now we see what what Dali was waiting for. Now this is not the final photo. This is the photo. It's a photo by Philip Halsman. Um, we'll, we'll talk about Philip Halsman. He's the inventor of the term um, jumpology. Very strange term. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, this is a, 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 the first stage of, uh, of, the, of the photo. You see Dali finally jumping. Um, well, let's look at the composition first. Um, we see a lot of frames. We see a chair um, uh, with a structure. We see, of course, that, that frame in the middle uh, with the easel. Uh, and we see uh, we see a, f a frameless um, uh, uh, painting on on the right. Uh, so lots of and of course the, the the most important frame is that of the of the photo itself. Uh, so lots of frames and and straights, but they seem to be floating and hanging. And um, we see a lot of curves. Obviously the details of the of the three cats. This, and the splash of water, and uh, and uh, Dali sort of uh, jumping uh, uh, with that magnificent face of his uh, in, in the air. Um, so we see frames and jumps, and uh, in, in this case, uh, open frames um, uh, that you see through the chair and the easel and the little bench on the right and bottom right. So we got we got this notion of, of window already very clearly. Um, uh, but uh, yes, it is a composition of, uh, of oppositions, it seems, uh, and the classic oppositions are um, frame uh, versus curves or straight lines versus curves. Uh, oh yeah, of course, the straight lines are all uh, of structural nature. So again, we get structure. Ergon versus play, jumping, uh, ornament, um, accident, obviously accident. This is, this is almost like a, an emblem of the 20th century. Uh, you know, Mies, Mies with his frames and uh, uh, opposed to Pollock uh, with, his, uh, with his exploration of, of, of chance and curves. So you, that, this is, a, this is a, 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 a really an emblem of this notion of uh, uh, chance and necessity. As, uh, as the title of, uh, of Jacques Monod's book went. Um, now let's look at the, the, because you can still see people uh, holding, the, holding the chair on the left. You don't see the people on the right. I think there might be a shadow on the bottom right corner. You don't see the three, uh, well, there's actually four people on the, on the right. 
um, one throwing a bucket, uh, emptying a bucket of water, obviously, and uh, three people throwing cats. And uh, what I've read about, this is the final picture, what I've read about uh, uh, about Philip Halsman with his team taking this picture, and the picture is actually called Dali Atomicus, Dali Atomicus, and it relates to Dali um, in his atomic period. We had, uh, Dali had a, an atomic period in his hyperrealist painting just after the Second World War, late late uh, 1940s till uh, till the mid 1950s, and. Uh, <coughs> um, we, we know from the reading that it actually took 28 times to uh, take this picture. So you can imagine, uh, I mean, holding the chair on the left is not so difficult. Maybe the, the throwing of the, the emptying of the bucket neither. Um, but mopping the floor 28 times, that's already something. Uh, and, and, and throwing the cats in the air th uh, by three people and then trying to grab them again, uh, hunt them down through the room. So this is, it's, 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 it must have been a hilarious moment. Um, it's, it's really a, a quite a magnificent photo. And, and you, what you can see on the, on the right is that picture. Um, it's not very clear, but it's a Leda Atomica. Leda Atomica, Leda uh, is a portrait of Gala, Gala the wife of uh, Salvador Dali. And uh, she's sitting, and we'll be, we'll be looking at that picture as well, uh, because now uh, we have Leda of Orgala Atomica on, on the right, and uh, Dali, Dali Atomicus in the middle as a photo. So we could very complex relationships between, uh, well, man and wife, um, but but also between painting and and, and photo. And um, I'm not sure if you, you noticed, but uh, here the frame, the middle frame is empty and here Dali himself added something in the middle and the photo, the print must have been quite large uh, because uh, Dali meticulously cut out the contours of the, of the empty frame. And uh, you can still see the easel, the straight line of the easel actually go through the through the splash of water you can still see that so that painting is just like cut under the water and around the, uh, the brush and uh, the edges of the frame and what you can see is um, Dali in his in his typical uh, sort of psychoplastic technique where everything is sort of half molten um, uh, you see the the contours of the cats you see the contours of the cats especially their tails and I think you see a woman uh, not not even reclining, but uh, almost like being dead on the ground. She looks very corpse-like. I'm not sure if that's Gala. Let's not speculate on that. But it's, what's important is, of course, the positioning of the of the of the cats, uh, especially because they're in the same style as as the splash of water. So we got this link between the liquidity of uh, of the water and the liquidity of the of the of the cats in the painting. Now, this is a photo, so the photo has been taken as an opportunity. Let's, let's immediately compare this to the arc of the grace machine. So we get this sort of, uh, this, this arc between two points in time. And we get this figure in the middle. And uh, the figure now is, uh, is, uh, is both the window. It's, it's like a window sort of trying to find that figure. And that figure is uh, first. It's it's the it's the camera window that takes the photo, so it's that's the window in time. And then there's this this other window. It's as a paint the window of a painting, which is a window in space. Something quite different, right? So painters actually go through a window and explore that open open sea, that open field um, of Raum, and uh, and. Uh, Photographers actually have this window as a, as a, as a moment, not as a field, but as a, as a pure point, um, and that's a window in time. So we get like two different things and two different notions of uh, of of what it what makes an opportunity. Now Dali, with his uh, with this uh, fabulous idea of. Uh, Photorealism. He was very interested in, in, in photography already very early on in the 30s. 
um, we see the position of the cats preceding the photo because it's a photo taken so it must be that 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 painting already existed before the photo was taken that opportunity was already found and now the cats are thrown in the air um, they actually coincide exactly with the, with the, the image though there there are molten cats or molten melted cats and, and the others are, are not melted they're meowing through the air there must have been an incredible sound of, uh, of the cats but we got these two frames now one in, in space and one in time that are actually exactly aligned and that's something that 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 should interest us because they're both gaps and we now got an art that is uh, um, uh, two, two arts that are trying to sort of each create their own gap and uh, trying to align them. Um, and what's also interesting for us is the, is the idea of the atomic. Um, uh, this is very complex um, uh, and I don't have a lot of time to discuss it but D Dali had his own form of atomism and um, if we use the word atomism, uh, we go all the way th t uh, more than 2,000 years back in time. We have a, a sort of Greek period of atomism and a, and a, and a Roman period of atomism. Uh, and uh, Dali actually refers to it as a, uh, as a form of physics. Uh, so um, and of course uh, we, we're in the late 1940s so uh, what do we have we just like after the second world war the cold war is starting and uh, we, we, we're having these uh, nuclear tests and that um, uh, the h-bomb already I think uh, the, uh, the hydrogen bomb and uh, so we, we have that type of interest in, in atomism and, uh, and, and uh, nuclear science but what's interesting is that what he, he says, and I'm trying to quote him directly, the painting, that, that's the Leda Atomica on the left, is in accordance with, with the modern nothing touches theory of intra-atomic physics. Nothing touches. And uh, so everything floats or everything jumps. That's of course, that's unclear because these things uh, seem to be suspended. They cast shadows. They've been very stabilized. Uh, Gala is uh, on the vertical axis. There we go again. She's uh, maybe in an extreme form of contrapposto. There's the, the beautiful swan. Um, all with the mythological references. Dali was always like extremely interested in, uh, in, uh, in classical beauty. Uh, on the right, we see Galatea, um, Galatea of the Spheres, um, which is a later painting, it's 1952. The further on the left is 1948. Um, uh, this interest in 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 in, uh, in atomism and nothing touches. Now, atomism normally is a theory of everything touches. Uh, Democrates. Uh, what's that 400 BC 300 BC maybe um, maybe even older um, um, his materialist theory is that of of atoms that mean they're indivisible and they link up they have very specific shapes and they link up and uh, these shapes are called schema schema and um, it's voids that uh, they, they sort of enclose voids so matter is actually always a combination according to Democrates, is always a combination of, of, of uh, void and atoms, void and atoms. And then um, um, there are slight changes in that, in that ancient atomism. Uh, we get a, a few hundred years later, we get Epicurus, uh, who ad actually adds the famous swerve. So it's now, it's, it's, it's a realm of falling and of course, when we get to the figure of falling, we'll be discussing this uh, more extensively. But we get this notion of falling, which is, uh, I mean, that is casus. It's not just case, but it means chance as well. So it's, there's chance and gravity, the throwing, the casting of the dice. But what's interesting in, in Epicurus, he adds the swerve to this, so the, the, the famous klinomen. Um, so there's a verticality of falling, and then there's 
uh, swerve. There's a, this notion of free will of atoms, and then they collide, and then they create form, right? So this is a, 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 a deeper understanding of, let's say, the combination of a, a, a vertical substance and uh, and uh, the swerving, swirling, sideways moving of uh, of accident, and then the, the of course accident becoming coincidence and the, the coinciding of two. Um, and then, um, uh, according to Epicurus, uh, when these atoms connect up, uh, an, 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 an image is secreted, is emitted. An image is emitted. In, in Greek, it's, it's idola. It, that's idola. And uh, so we already get a connection here between imagery and uh, atomism. And of course, with the famous Lucretius who is now writing in Latin, and we'll get to Lucretius more extensively later, is, uh, is yeah, the, these idola are actually super thin. They're super thin, uh, like photos. And uh, uh, it's almost an olfactory uh, notion of, uh, of seeing. It's actually the image comes towards us. Uh, after, the, after the atoms, these dark atoms, which are invisible, and, and not just indivisible, they're also invisible, and then they collide, they make form, and then that form secretes uh, simulacra, or figure, as, as, uh, as Lucretius called them. So this, that's a, it's a very complex theory of void atoms and images. And um, that's, of course, interesting to us, because um, we have now Dali saying something similar, though different. Because for him, um, it's the atoms themselves that are images. You can see that on the right, and the images are actually in focus. And together, they they make uh, an image we, we can't really see. Right there's there's Gala, uh, the Gala, uh, his wife again, a portrait, but she's sort of blurred. So what we get is that the atoms are in focus, are sharp images, and then together they make this much larger image. Uh, well, it's not an image anyway because it's blurred, which is also important to us because we we spoke about blurring and the je ne sais quoi. So we got this idea of nothing touches um, in, uh, and 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 everything touches, and for him this this uh, nothing touches is actually the opening up, the open the the gap making it on the molecular level all the way to a much larger level to to what images and appearances are. So this idea of, uh, of, of things that, that relate to each other by caps, this, this incredible articulation of everything, of these, these members having loose connections, uh, actually make uh, the appearance. Now that uh, this is a, a very long introduction um, to Leibniz because um, I, I do, I, I mean, I'm just one, one, one image on, uh, on, on Leibniz, and uh, we should have uh, many, many more, because he deserves it. But he, uh, he uh, distinguishes himself from uh, the old atomists, though, though his theory of the monad is as small, they, these elements are as small as... Uh, as atoms, actually, it's the monadology starts with this famous uh, first paragraph, saying that monads are sans partie. You know, it, it's written in French. Uh, so they're without parts, so they're they're indivisible. They don't have any parts anymore. And uh, mm -hmm. these parts, what's interesting about these uh, monads is um, that they're very different from uh, um, the atoms. In the sense that they're not black, they're actually uh, they're, they're appetites. Um, so they're completely on the. Uh, he actually calls them souls. Uh, so they're really on the level of consciousness. They're really on the level of consciousness. So what makes image? What what comes as image at the end with the, with the classic atomists? Now comes much much earlier, but it's still something that is small and. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite beautiful. It's just that um, for, for Leibniz, this, um, he, he keeps the notion of uh, inclination of the klinonen. So the, the, the swirl 
uh, actually uh, the, the swerve uh, becomes the whole universe for for uh, Leibniz. And, uh, this is of course the famous uh, uh, law of continuity. Is uh, natura non facit saltum. Mm -hmm. Nature does not make any jumps. Nature does not make jumps. And uh, which became uh, the paradigm of of, uh, of Charles Darwin. Uh, I I remember actually uh, his, uh, the friend of Darwin actually writing to him on the evening of uh, uh, it's called the Bulldog of Darwin. Um, Huxley, of course, Huxley, um, on the evening is of uh, the publication of The Origin of Species, he said, um, yeah, I'm in total agreement with what you're saying, except uh, this, this natura uh, non facit saltum, uh, because uh, nature does make jumps. So it was already a huge issue in the time of, of Darwin. Of course, it's, it's a much bigger issue in in the time of Leibniz and uh, what's so interesting is like how is it possible for for Leibniz to have this realm of continuities of continuity and then at the same time constructed with monads and uh, this is of course his famous invention of differential calculus uh, where you get um, the curves of continuity and then the points on those lines, uh, which constantly vary according to their tangents. So in that sense, a, a curve, especially a curve that is so complex, and uh, well, uh, third degree curves, we call them, um, are very different from straight lines in the sense that a straight line officially, according to Euclid, is made out of points. Um, but such a definition would not make sense uh, uh, to discuss a curve uh, because these, uh, you would not be able to understand that change of direction uh, which, is, uh, which inhabits that straight line and makes it a curve. And that's of course the, the, the tangent and that tangent is inclined. Um, so we get the, the, the idea of constant swerving is a change of, of inclination and that makes this infinitesimal infinite a small point um, of, the, of the monad possible right so that the world of continuity can actually be broken up by 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 infinite points by infinite points and these points um, are organized by tangents so a, a curve in that sense is, is made up of, of straight lines and, and not of points and these straight lines constantly um, vary in, in direction and that varying in direction makes it a, a curve. Now, the, the nothing touches of Dali is broken up. It's, it is a pluralist world, not a, not a monist world. It is a pluralist world. And um, it, why does ma nature make jumps? Um, to produce images, to produce images. So the notion of a void, which is absent I have to be careful here, but it seems to be absent in uh, in Leibniz. is is now part of the of the uh, the, the universe of Dali, but it's it's not uh, your typical spatial void. It's uh, it's a void that allows for images to be um, emitted on all all levels of of existence. So natura semper facit saltus. It, it, it nature always makes jumps, right? So we've got like two opposing models, though. Though they seem to be related because they work with the same uh, um, attributes, okay, like atoms and images and uh, continuity or discontinuity. So it has uh, like similar properties, but in a different order. And this different order actually makes it makes it possible for them to to have like a law of, the, of continuity on one side, as you can see in the in the note, and a law of of, of discontinuity. The the, the it, well, it, it's nothing touches, but it's so intimate in its in its nothing touch. It always remembers me of, of Dali and Gala. Cause it was, uh, they were like separated, but in 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 a, in a very intimate way um, that that will bring us back to uh, this long discussion will bring us back to uh, to uh, Philip Halsman um, the jump book um, the inventor of uh, of, of jumpology um, 
I think we have to, uh, uh, yeah, get an understanding of what what Halsman was trying to do because um, he uh, uh, and that uh, he I think he took about 190 photos, portrait photos of, of very famous people. Here you see a few Shirley MacLaine on the left and uh, and uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Jerry Lewis uh, are on the right. Um, he took photos of very famous people, portrait photos, but um, a, a portrait, a portraited person, is that English portraited, um, would be called a sitter in, if you go to the role of, uh, of, of painting. But uh, he hated the notion of, of, uh, of sitting for a photo. And of course, in the 19th century, um, to take a portrait photo in the 19th century would, would mean that you would either have to stand very still or or sit uh, because it would take so so long to actually produce the photo but um, uh, he hated this idea of 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 uh, portraiting people taking portraits of people to uh, um, actually as sitters because that gave him so much control over their uh, posture and he, he was very interested in in seeing uh, what he could do to take some of that control out. Again, this is very uh, typical for 20th century opposition between necessity and chance and uh, stability and an and, and accident. And uh, the strange thing is, is that um, they're actually not very good photos. And, uh, and, and <laughs> You can see that on the left, it's uh, because it, it, it takes an enormous energy to uh, to jump, uh, and, and it's quite fabulous. All these famous people jump, even judges and uh, senators. You would, and they would all jump like in very different ways. It would be beautiful to show them all because some just jump like a bit vertically, and others like go very high, and others are very controlled because they're dancers or actors, so they they. They jump not like vertically, but they jump in sort of arc and and uh, w with a lot of elegant um, positioning of of legs and arms. Um, but you can see from the face of Shirley MacLaine that she's, she's quite distorted, and uh, and uh, you can see sort of the 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 the, 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 the grimace on her face, which actually works very well. The right because they're comedians, and the comedians are of course experts in distorting their faces because it's all like well I mean comedy is about the elasticity of the body and <laughs> just thinking of Groucho Marx but also the elasticity of the, of the face and, and making ugly faces and, and Jerry Lewis of course was an expert in that so that she fits very well with the with the photo what is incredibly interesting is that what 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 Halsman seems to be saying is uh, is that each photo is a, is a jump, or he wants each photo to be a jump? That there's somehow that there's this this notion of opportunity and instant and and moment that a photo has to has to grasp. Um, now this is a big question: Are you taking a picture, or is it is it a given moment? Is it a given moment? And, and this will be part of our discussion. But um, and and. and since there is a, the notion of opportunity in the painting, uh, which is much more an opportunity in space because you're going through a window and exploring the space that you've created by, by your canvas, um, is very different than um, taking a photo because then you're taking the photos from events, right? So if you have people jump, uh, that becomes an event. So you actually have to like, um, take a moment out of out of the continuity of time let's put it like this and this and then you get a continuity of time and uh, you have to grasp an, an instant this is already important because uh, there we go uh, we have this opposition of, of time as a flow as a continuity and uh, and the, the instant as something that stands and uh, I think that's so interesting about uh, um, Philip Halsman's idea of, of jumpology is that he's trying to say, okay, there's this, this photography is actually uh, uh, this 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 uh, 
dealing with uh, with either the given moment or the, or the taking of a, of a picture. <coughs> now somebody who was quite obsessed with this idea is of course Henri Cartier-Bresson um, and, uh, and that photo on the left is, is just, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the jump, uh, it's just an incredible uh, um, uh, example of, of a, what uh, Cartier-Bresson tried to do is um, is to find the jump is uh, what he called the uh, l'instant décisif or in English uh, the decisive moment it actually is as an uh, instant is, is, a, is a better term um, she's lifting her heels to, to kiss him and uh, that guy is so stiff and and that stiffness is uh, is so perfectly mm, mm, echoed by the lampposts and the architecture and the shadows um, that it is a whole world of, uh, of verticalism except for for that, that minimum minimum gag, gap on, under her heels and um, what a photo and uh, on the right it's a much more famous photo of a, a Cartier-Bresson is uh, the, the the puddle photo? It's called a puddle, but it's it's actually a flooded, a, a hugely uh, f flooded piece of uh, of uh, either a square or a, or a street of, of of somebody trying to jump over uh, the puddle, but it, it's obviously not going to work. It's the same minimal dif difference between uh, the, the water and uh, and the heel. But uh, this is not going to, to end very well. Obviously, this person will land in the water and uh, and maybe even slip. Um, so we 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 get these same oppositions. We get these same oppositions of uh, of substance, of stance and stability, and and uh, and uh, and jumping as a, as an expression of accident. Or life, or or taking a chance, or, uh, and the same opposition, but they're becoming very much, much, much closer. And uh, you know, Cartier-Bresson is is trying to sort of find uh, uh, something that's that actually says, you know, this accident is actually that that's what the instant, what makes the instant. It's not that architecture. Um, that is so stable over time and, and uh, constantly emphasizes uh, the continuity of time. Well, well, they had the other instant, this other instant of the of the posture, which is uh, is actually breaking away from that continuity and uh, and, and creating an, another type of uh, of stance. Um, that opposition. Um, we know is from a, a contemporary artist on the left, uh, Jeff Wall. And uh, what makes Jeff Wall interesting is that like he is almost like, um, again, using the same attributes as uh, Cartier Bresson, but um, in a reverse manner, because I'm um, uh, not sure if anybody ever saw um, the photos of, uh, of Jeff Wall printed out, but they're as large as paintings. Uh, this is not the best example. Some are, some are really horizontal and extremely large, um, and they're hanging in museums uh, on the walls. Uh, and you see there again. So you get the architecture of the museum, and here you get, on the left you get the architecture of the building, similarly to uh, similar to uh, what Cartier-Bresson was was doing in the previous photo. Um, and then insert accident insert accident so this, they're almost like in, in the reverse position so we get Cartier-Bresson working for what a life magazine we're in the late 1940s um, 50s um, uh, Paris Match uh, maybe Vogue um, uh, so these uh, magazines um, so museums versus magazines and uh, museums about time institutional architectural uh, institutions um, that span over time and, and magazines that are like um, different every week 
uh, that are about the everyday, about stri street life, about actuality and, and journalism. Uh, journalism means day. Uh, so they're coming from different worlds. They're coming from different worlds and uh, they seem to be crossing over because uh, Jeff Wall is in a museum world of stability and tries to look for accident. Obviously, there's just like this, this, this milk is ejected from the from the pack, and um, and uh, um, Cartier Bresson always trying to look for, uh, though he's photographing accident, right? This, this, the accidental and chance, and he is interested uh, in in composition, in the stability of the photo. So there's like a there's a crossing over from stability to accident and from accident to stability and composition. What's interesting, they're both uh, using liquids, right? So milk, milk on the left and, uh, and, and water on the right. So very similar to the bucket of water uh, um, thrown uh, acro across the photo of, uh, of Philip Halsman. <coughs> Now let's let's go back to uh, um, uh, Lucretius. Uh, I'm not going to translate all the all the Latin, um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a beautiful term in there. We see a, a tempora cato and a tempora puncto, and it's really this last one that that interests us. Uh, that should interest us so much um, because it's a, it it's translated sometimes as a the given moment, and sometimes as pointed time, even pointed time, time in the form of a point. So the, the idea of a, of, a, of a moment atom, the time atom, an atomic time, or actually uh, atomic time. I've, I've seen that the, the translation. Uh, I think there's a quite a. It's not not a very long text by Merrill, William Merrill, uh, on tempora puncto, and uh, he actually this. Uh, suggests uh, atom time or atomic time so there's this indivisible moment of, of, of time but it's also like yeah uh, a, a, a given moment so the the, the, the the continuity of time in the falling it's often um, I think in the, uh, I'm not sure if it's already in Epicurus but for sure in Lucretius it's this constant falling uh, understood uh, Often described with the metaphor of raindrops falling, so there's a, this notion of gravity, and then the, the swerving sideways and the collision, and then the creation of the of the image um, of the simulacrum, uh, and then that image sort of uh, uh, flies through the air in 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 all directions and until it hits our uh, our. Uh, eyes and Dem Democrates already wrote about this how the idola uh, hit the eyes and it's just the same atomic notion so somehow uh, of course Democritus never gets to the consciousness of an image right it kept uh, its material atoms hitting each other and touching each other and then flying through the air in the form of an image but it never becomes an image because it hits our eyes in the same way they hit each other like a, a hammer and an anvil and it goes all the way through your brain and it's like this const constant uh, material connections like uh, of course it's it's a billiard ball universe but with a lot of extra accident and uh, incalculability in that sense and uncertainty but it, it might be able to describe the image but it never gets to the the quality of of of, of consciousness and uh, of course that's what what Leibniz did try to solve and and and, and uh, Dali in his in a surreal way uh, that Dali is trying to attack that uh, that that problem <coughs> now let's um, um, look at uh, an, 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 a coincidence I'm not sure if it's a coincidence but on the right we uh, we there's one page of, uh, of a book by Roland Barthes um, the camera lucida um, uh, camera lucida officially as a, as a reverse of the camera obscura um, a, a very interesting use of the of the same t uh, term punctum 
and, uh, and, and, and very Lucretian in its understanding of, uh, of, of what a photo is. And this is a book, a beautiful book about uh, photography and uh, what photography is and uh, why some photos actually hit us and other photos don't so and this notion of hitting is is uh, what what uh, what Roland Barthes calls uh, punctum punctum uh, a photograph's punctum is that accident which pricks me but also bruises me is poignant to me so it is a it is a what do you call it? a sting a speck a cut a little hole a little hole so the hole and the and the puncturing so to speak the puncturing of the eye are like the same thing and it's also cast of the dice so we're really in the world of accident here um, but it's not it's not now um, the accident um, becoming an instant as a, as in Cartier Bresson it's not the taking of the photo it's what the photo does or what the photo is so there's this it's the other side of the photo right one is like the, the the photographer and the camera taking the photo and the other is is uh, is how we actually receive the photo and maybe the first instance is also a a, a, a a sense of giving because it's the given moment that allows you or the op gives you the opportunity allows you the opportunity uh, to take the photo so that uh, there's a, a lot of taking and uh, and and giving in in alternating positions um so punct, punct, tempora puncto and, uh, and 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 a photo as a as a as, as a punctum and he uh, opposes that to uh, the word studium so we got a page 26 and 27 from from that book the translation the english translation of the book and um, studium is really um, a sort of general interest. It's a general interest. So it could be a photo from everyday life. It could be a photo, a sports photo. It could be a photo from a landscape. It could be a, a, a photo from politics or from war. So there's a, these are like general subjects. These create sort of a field of interest, but that's not what really interests us it's the punctum that comes out of the out of the studium right uh, that's a that's a really interesting um, uh, idea of course the studium is um, is related to substance again and 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 uh, and, uh, and, the st and the punctum to uh, to accident but that's sort of the the idea that um, um, there's these two layers on a, on a photo and uh, one is of general interest and, and one is of far more uh, specific interest and of course uh, it's it's uh, very imp important to us to understand like well what is this actually what, what is the flatness of the photo what is the what is the the gap in time um, is it a photo of an accident or is the photo itself an accident and is that accident happening to us or is it an, a photo of an accident happening to somebody else that then happens to us so there's a lot of alignments of of gaps and openings uh, in in this notion of photography and uh, and the camera as a frame uh, and how that relates to uh, to how we actually uh, see it but it's i mean it's already so important to to think of like how can it be a little hole as well as 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 almost like an arrow something that pricks us and uh, one of his best best pages in the book is uh, page 96 and we really get to the core uh, we really get to the core of the book because um, it's not really a, a photo of an accident it is a, a um, it is it is something far more complex so if we look at the jump from 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 two perspectives there's one that is says okay from from the first moment to the last moment we get this arc right and this arc can be like a, a small moment in time like a child jumping during playing or it can be an extremely long and and stretched uh, like birth and death for instance and here is uh, uh, 
it's about how how that um, uh, that arc can be contracted to that almost the apex of the jump and that apex doesn't have to be exactly in the middle that apex of the jump um, that becomes the instant that becomes the instant and uh, that actually sort of uh, brings both sides together. So uh, what is this photo? It's the photo of uh, Louis Payne, um, uh, a handsome, handsome young man, very young, I think he's 21 or something. And he, he just tried to kill um, um, the Secretary of State. And this is exactly the same day as uh, both um, uh, killing um, Abraham Lincoln in uh, 1863, I believe, 1865. Oh, here in, eight, in 1865, young Louis Payne tried to assassinate Secretary of State Seward. Right, so uh, that assassination attempt, of course, um, uh, failed, and he was caught and um, put in handcuffs and in his in his uh, jail cell. This is the photo taken in his jail cell. And it is just before his execution, just before his ex execution, and uh, that's that's the punctum. He is going to die. So, what is the photo? This is uh, the, this will be, and this has been. So he is like looking in the future at the end of the arc, while we are looking at the past because he's already dead. And. Uh, I think that's that for for uh, for Roland Barthes is really the essence of photography. It's, it's like not just this arc, but it's also the contraction of this arc into a, into a figure or a photo, and that makes it makes it something that pricks us, or that hits us, or strikes us. These are very specific terms, almost like arrows or knives. So that's a, it, that's as as much an accident that happens to us as it happens. <laughs> Not in the same way, obviously, as that will happen to uh, Louis Payne, to for his execution, and then we get to uh, um, Roland Bart actually mentioning the, the 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 photo that is that really instigated the, the writing of this book. That's the photo because it's at that time when he wrote this book, um, his mother uh, had already passed away, and we know how important. Uh, the mother of Roland Bart was to him, and he sees this photo of her as a child, as a child, so we're at the beginning of the arc, and uh, and she is already dead. So we we get again that that double perspective. He sees her as a child, and he knows she's already dead. So we get this being and not being, over overlapping, and uh, and, and and that's exactly what makes the in him the instant. Of the, of the cat catastrophe, uh, the catastrophe of uh, of uh, of this death. So, the, and he says, whether or not the subject is already dead, every photograph is this catas catastrophe. Um, wow. So it's not really the photo of an accident, but the taking of the photo is such an accident because it will always be over and it's always has been born right so there's always this jump whatever moment uh, we 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 see through that window we take that opportunity every moment you take that photo you're actually contracting that arc you're actually t contracting that arc and you're creating that that figure in the middle that's this argument um, well, I, I, you wouldn't be able to say that it's every photo because of, um, clearly photos can be fleeing. Um, but he's talking about yeah, wonderful, uh, magnificent photos. Um, maybe not great, but uh, photos that 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 hit us or that happened to us. Let's put it like that. That, that happened to us instead of we, we just like seeing the photo. We, the photo actually happens to us, and, um, and that's a quite a magnificent idea of uh, of, uh, of of understanding what uh, what a photo is. Because now the the 
the accident actually becomes the, the substance of the photo. So it's 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 really that sort of that middle, that notion of the instant being able to track all time, all the continuity of time. I have all the rhythm just like in, in, in that single moment. So that's a really a very postural notion of, uh, of, uh, of, of what, a, what a photo is because it understands both the, the movement over time as, as, well as, the, as well as the stance of the, of the instant. So the, and, and that in, in, in ancient Greece was called Kairos. Um, I'm not going to like uh, go too deep into it, but it's it's not like uh, the, this is a, an in, a 20th century invention. Uh, it's quite clear um, uh, in uh, in rhetoric um, how Chronos and uh, Kairos are uh, separated from each other, and Chronos uh, very much on the on the on uh, Roland Barthes side of the studium, something that goes on and on and that that makes history and and chronology. And Kairos really being this, this, uh, this opportunity, and you see how many uh, different meanings it has. It could means profit or advantage, but also even measure or proportion, which we of course discussed in the in the case of Ephrismia. Uh, so Kairos is uh, the, the the idea of Kairos is is really this is sort of uh, this this seizing, uh, seizing the moment, or seizing the opportunity. Um, and now we go back to sports because uh, we, we remain interested in uh, in, in uh, what sports is and um, h how it produces this incredible amount of, of figures and uh, how how it, it um, added time and play to sculpture and. Uh, um, I don't think it's it's any accident that uh, that sports became so important after the the, the early 1900s, even with the Olympic Games. Uh, I think it's it has to do with film and it has to do with uh, photography. Obviously, this is a photo, and the, the, this whole notion of of, of posture being uh, a contraction of time. Is uh, is so important? Something that sculpture j just wasn't able to do anymore, and uh, so in that sense, sports, in, in my mind, is that it's really sort of an extreme installation art, um, uh, where it adds chance and uh, competition and all these rules of uh, of what play is, the seriousness of of play, and. Uh, how that relates to this constant posture, it's like in, in, in so many different variations of, of, of jumping. Um, and of course we have to look at the figure who, uh, who, who shot that. I'm not sure if it actually goes in the goal or not, it seems to be going all the way in the crossing and, and, and looping over the goalkeeper. Uh, which is uh, like already a whole uh, mind-boggling idea of now we have a window in space and now we have a window in time of the photographer and, and of course of the of the person who t uh, the player who took the free kick uh, Lionel Messi uh, and so we got many types of frames many times of, of curves we see curved body we see a curved shot and we see a curved player so we get like a, 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 again these uh, this this splash of water, but then jumping um, through different windows and either going in the goal or not. It's, uh, it's uh, at this point not so important, of course. With with Messi, it goes in the goal almost all the time. Very frustrating for everybody who's for all the players who's st who's standing in 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 that wall trying to stop. Um, but I'm I'm interested in in, uh, in in what that shot is. Um, is it is it is it? And, and I'm very interested in what the what the photo is, um, because uh, somehow the the photo um, tells us what the, what the what the shot is. So there's a shot of the photo, and there's a shot of uh, of a messy in this case, and maybe even shot. Another photographer is taking the photo of the, of the goalkeeper trying to stop it, stop the, the free kick. Um, but there's an alignment. There's an alignment here. There's um, there's uh, there's Messi. And we showed him already. Is like he's he's uh, he's in a curved space, or he's uh, he's breaking space, 
or is cracking it open and uh, he, he sees this this window and uh, of course it's it's in this case it's a window in space uh, next to or above uh, that that wall of, of of players sometimes eight eight different players like lining up and he's like uh, sh having this curved shot he's creating this curved shot and then uh, through this window and then there's the window of the camera which perfectly aligns and of, of course that window in, of the camera is a window in time so you get like the two different windows, a window in space and a, and a window in time, exactly like aligning, uh, an alignment of gaps, um, which we, we can't photograph the gap, gap itself. Uh, it's just impossible, but um, it, it's, it becomes really, really interesting how these, this, this uh, elusive notion of of the gap becomes this very very elusive notion of uh, of, of the figure um, so I have a photo of the photographers um, I, th I, th I think it's a stunning image um, and now I'll be adding a new photographer but I'm, I'm, that's not so important in this case but the, 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 the question really becomes is is this um, what is the figure exactly? What is, what is that figure? Is it, is it the can can you take a photo of a figure? And uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't think so. Um, um, a, f a photo, especially a good photo, is sharp and in focus. And um, we define the figure as something that has a that has a certain blur that that um, that is a sort of sweep and. Um, um, almost like slow motion. It's like a, I'm, I'm, I'm almost standing still, or there's movement in the standing still, but there is this blur. This uh, feelings are called the, the je ne sais quoi, the je ne sais quoi. And so the, uh, the the figure is not exactly the photo. It's it's much more the taking of the photo, and it's the 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 the, the, the taking of the f of the free kick. The shooting of the of the of the ball and curving the ball around uh, the wall. So there's there's a there's this idea of uh, and of course there's je ne sais quoi if we see Messi shoot his free kick because we have no idea how he's doing it and we have something similar with the photographers. How do they find this moment? Of course, you, there's many photographers and one takes a fantastic photo and the other doesn't. And sometimes they ca they take a lot of photos with the motor camera, so they take and they can choose the best one. But it's I mean that's already a notion of slow motion. That is like this technology slowing down. I'm just thinking of Leni Riefenstahl trying to sort of get to the sculpture of uh, of uh, of athletes, right? By by inventing the slow motion. It's I think is is just one of the the best inventions of uh, of of uh, of uh, visual technology. Slow motion. And this idea of, uh, of, of finding the figure um, and uh, I, I, I think in that sense they're they are doing something similar they're, they're sort of trying to sort of su find this sweep and then cho choose the best photo but the, it's not the same thing it's uh, the, 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 the photo of a figure is not exactly the figure so that the figure is always a, a, a sense of blur and uh, je ne sais quoi. Well, well, photos are sharp and thin. Um, I'd say a figure is thick. Uh, it is opaque, actually. It is opaque. And you can take images out of it. That's what they're doing. They're taking images out of it. And these are in focus, but all these images on top of each other. And that's almost like the galaxy of the spheres of, of, um, of Dali. All these atoms are sharp and in focus. You put them together, you actually get a blurred image. There's, there's something that is a, a blur and you can actually it's a spatial organization too it's like all these images are overlapping and creating this blur and, and, and this blur I would call an appearance so that there's a, there's something more general about the figure that allows uh, many many possible images and, and many possible uh, uh, photos so it's not a single idol and of course uh, that, that's uh, Lucretius would say the same there's not just like one image being depleted from from this dark matter 
right? There must be a constant flow of, of images, and uh, well, how how would then things not lose their weight, right? It's like a, that's an impossible idea. So there must be something that is not loosening from matter, but it's in between matter that is that is a, a form of consciousness. So I'm I'm really interested in this idea of of, of shining, of radiance. And, but also in arrows, um, and there's, there are so many images of uh, Apollo as a, as, a, as a radiant figure. Um, <clears throat> um, Apollo is always seen as a... Apollo is always seen as this... Uh, um, beautiful ideal uh, young god um, I don't want to speculate on it or, or directly but uh, there's a there's clearly an, uh, a parallel of Zeus and uh, Apollo as his son and uh, of course God and Christ and uh, we know that from early images of Christ uh, he didn't have a beard and he had a spiked halo and uh, the only spiked halo that was uh, well known uh, in, in uh, let's say the first centuries of, uh, of Christianity is that of Apollo uh, so we have the crown and the, and the, and the spiked spiked halo and um, here you see something else it's like the whole body is spiked uh, we call that a mandala so it's, it's a, a bodily halo but what I find so interesting in Apollo and the images of Apollo is that um, is that there's a, um, um, a congruence between, let's say, the shining, the radiance of that figure, as well as um, as the, the bow and the arrow, and um, that's actually the attributes of Apollo. Um, we know the bow and the lyre. Um, so you can play the bow and make sound with it and you can play the lyre and strike somebody's heart obviously that's so we get this uh, this uh, this doubling and this reversal of, of the bow and the lyre of, of beauty and uh, and uh, well terror because uh, you should keep in mind uh, I'm, I'm just trying to remember the article by Marcel Detienne on Apollo and he calls him the, the slaughterhouse the slaughterhouse of Apollo because there's there's no god in, in ancient Greece that kills as many uh, humans and gods as, uh, as, uh, as Apollo and he strikes with his bow and um, and uh, of course it's it, the, the shot of a bow is as curved as that of uh, Lionel Messi there's no way you can can shoot straight uh, so we are we having a crooked god here uh, who, who shoots uh, who looks horizontally and and shoots vertically and uh, which I think is uh, I talked a bit about Apollo and Dionysus and uh, the Dionysus in, in early Nietzsche's idea is so like okay Apollo is the that god of uh, form and uh, everything is in proportion and no excess and uh, Dionysus is all about excess but uh, that's not true uh, Dionysus um, the, the cult of Dionysus was actually part of the temple of Apollo uh, only in like small parts uh, over the year, over the seasons. Uh, so they allowed the, 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 uh, the priests, priestesses of Dionysus in, in the temple of Apollo. But, uh, but the priestess of, uh, of uh, the, the Apollinian cult was as ex extreme in her epiphanies and ecstasies as, as those of uh, Dionysus. And of course, uh, Apollo is a radiant figure. What what else is that? This image of uh, of uh, of excess. Well, well, I I think what's really uh, important to say is that um, that the ex uh, the notion of excess in Dionysus is um, without limit. And uh, of course, excess means sort of the transgression of a limit. But then there is no limit anymore. So we get this sort of. Uh, 
complete emptying out of 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 the of the of the first the first contour of the thing i'm just thinking back of the frayed things of uh, william james so you get that contour and then you get that excess of uh, of fraying or fringes and uh, i'm seeing a similar image here again it's like okay we could get that body of uh, apollo and then there's sort of this this finding of a second contour and i think that's what apollo is doing um there's a there's a, a it is a measure he is about measure but it is a measure of excess he's not he's not a teetotaler he's not a teetotaler he's not a man of abstinence not at all so he's not the anti-dionysus <laughs> he is a, he, he, he can probably drink as much as anybody it's well known that socrates uh, drank more than anybody and never got drunk and um, but there's there's a sort of um a limitation to this uh, to this access to this uh, to this form of ecstasy and uh, i think that's interesting so it's it's not just like a transgressing that that contour of the body but it's also like finding a, finding a second contour i think that's what the gap is all about this is just this horizontal and then adding transcendence to that that, that horizontal that vertical aspect of of the of the curved shot and uh, whatever you, whatever you do as a, as a, as a bowman is um, is you have to you cannot shoot straight you always have to find the gap you always have to uh, cross through the gap and not through space and uh, i think we have many many examples in uh, in, in in modern sports of this um, um, <laughs> I'm just showing this uh, this famous little book of Eugen Herigl. It doesn't have a very good name, but that's not so important. Now it's then in the art of archery. Uh, uh, there's a lot of criticism on it, and obviously um, a lot of it is false. Uh, but in the in, in the late 1920s, Herigl uh, was in Japan, and he and he learned how to shoot uh, with a bow, which in uh, Japan is a uh, is a uh, is a form of meditation it's called kyodo and um of course yeah and that is the art of the of the curved shot it's just a, a quite a beautiful uh, photo on the right of uh, young women girls actually shooting this very very tall bow um, you're not shooting in the middle i mean that's the image on the on the left is a bit off because uh, the bow you actually uh, grab the bow at a third of the bottom so you're not in the middle you're actually doing an asymmetrical um, uh, spanning of the st of the string but what's interesting about Herigl is um, there he has this notion of Zen and um, and uh, a, a lot of talking with uh, with the, his uh, the master bowman who teaches him to uh, to 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 shoot um, I mean as it, a certain point he goes all the way to yoda i mean it's like a, a, not yoga but yoda like as in star wars and he goes like a, almost like the blind shot that's not true that's not true according to japanese uh, uh, scholars but um, there is this notion of a, of a, of a, of a letting go letting go so there's um of 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 this meditation and, and we find that in many religions especially religions that make use of um, of posture now christianity doesn't do that very often but we do know the notion of kenosis of the emptying out you see the water it's mentioned very often uh, when we get to saints uh, the life of a saint and trying to empty themselves out um, uh, either by uh, by abstinence or, or in any other way of, of, of meditation or prayer um, but it is a it is an important idea is that this emptying out is a is a sort of a letting go uh, so there's not a control of consciousness over the arrow and then um, putting the arrow uh, shooting it into the the target it's actually a loss of of consciousness and and a, and a no, and a notion of effortlessness um there we go um uh, there is a for that is a, a discussion of grace and um, and again it's not something you control grace is really this moment of uh, of letting go 
are letting things happen and not just making them happen, making them happen. So they're, they're in that sense, and we, we see it in athletes too, um, especially in athletes that succeed and in the interviews afterwards, they, they say, well, I'm not really sure how it ha happened uh, when they won. And often you see them crying because they're so overwhelmed by, by the fact that it actually happened to them. So there is as much uh, passivity in, in action as there is action in, in passivity. And, and in that sense, the, the idea of Zen, of course, it relates to Buddhism. Uh, we would have to say that Zen is really, uh, I mean, uh, it comes uh, via a form of Buddhism. And uh, the, 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 the idea of dhyana, um, uh, of mindfulness and meditation, it really comes from Buddhism in, into Zen, uh, into the Japan and, and uh, China. But there is this, this idea of, of letting happen of, and uh, things happening to you as much as you make them happen. So we get this sort of reprise, as Paolo would say, this, this reprise between uh, activity and, and, and passivity. And, and with passivity, I'm thinking of yoga too. Uh, uh, the asana, the asana, um, uh, I think there are 84 uh, positions. It's, it's a really postural meditation. It's not at all a form of fitness. <laughs> Just the word fitness in this, in this, in this uh, context is a horrible idea. It's really about the gap. So nothing fits. And, 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 and uh, the, your posture is, 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 is really about um, finding this moment of, uh, of, of passivity, the very complex postures, but the, the most simple one is the, the Padma Asana is, uh, is the Lotus. Uh, often these names have, uh, have uh, uh, animal uh, references, the cobra, the, uh, the, cr the crane bird. Um, there's a, a, a lot of different types of, uh, of, of, of animal postures. The, that relate to uh, to the different postures of, of yoga. So we get a yoga to get to get this notion of sitting, and of course the spine you know, with the spine of, uh, of uh, Frida Kahlo, but in this case, like completely vertical. These different stages of uh, of uh, of uh, improving uh, consciousness. Now, uh, we know that in sports, uh, we know that very well in sports, and uh, um, just looking at baseball here. Um, um, they call it, I think, the, uh, the, the crack of the bat. Um, this, this beautiful sound that, that sort of silences a whole stadium. Um, when uh, you get this, the, the perfect hitting of the of the ball, and uh, don't forget, we get a, a curve, a curve ball or a curved ball. So that the cast itself, the trajectory itself is already curved, and then the, the figure is curved, and the bat is curved, and it's all these curves meeting each other in, in that hitting. And um, uh, of course, training has to do with it. Um, uh, but it's not like um, you act while you act and while you hit that ball with that gesture. It's not like you take that gesture out of an archive. It's not like a perfect repetition of 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 what you habituated through training. Um, of course, they do this. It's merciless, right? It's like day in, day out, they're hitting the ball uh, or missing it, and, uh, and trying to position their body, trying to get the weight behind it, all all these things. But it's it it's not a repetition of your habits it's actually a breaking away of your, of your habits because yes the, fi the figure is um, relates to memory but it's it's deposited in the archive but it's not taken out right so every time yes there is a rhythm but it's it's also a breaking away um, um it's almost a breaking away from the from the flesh itself um and and the finding of this this window, there's somehow somewhere is this window b between the, uh, the the man hitting and the, and the baseball bat and the ball and in its curved trajectory. There's this 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 
point in space or this sound I don't, maybe uh, we use again uh, Henri Lefebvre's idea of sound uh, that we can we cannot see that hit but we can certainly hear it there's a, there's a very specific theories about the, the crack of the bat being a very specific sound and there's even um, baseball trainers and coaches that can say that can already say from a very young age of if players will succeed in their careers because they they hit that they have that certain sound of 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 hitting the ball now that that brings me to um, uh, to this image um, it's not a photo i took myself but i've seen it very very often now i live in atlanta it's not the deep south but it's uh, it is uh, is very southern and subtropic and there's an incredible amount of animals uh, in, here in the suburbs and uh, you can actually see deer and coyotes in parks and um, every now even in the like a front yard of a, of a suburban home but there's incredible amount of squirrels and um, the most beautiful thing to see is uh, not just squirrels jumping uh, between branches because of branches of a single toe of the same tree it's the most beautiful thing to see is actually a squirrel jumping um, from the branches of, of one tree to a neighboring tree and, uh, and this photo is in focus but uh, if you if you would watch it you would see that the end of the branch is so thin it can hardly carry the weight of the of the squirrel and uh, so at the moment it walks over to the end of the branch it's already bending and it's and it's not brand bending like uh, in, in a single direction it bends in many ways because of the weight of the of the squirrel but also the shape of the of the branch and then it has to push push off and obviously the the, the more it pushes off the more erratic the movement of the branch will become and 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 the, the more uh, the, the bigger the chance that it will not reach uh, the other the other side so we get we are like we because we understand like a jump as an arc between a and b uh, but a is totally blurred here it's like it go uh, because he it, 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 it pushes off too hard uh, it, there's too much chaos and if he, if he if he doesn't push hard enough he won't reach the other end and now if there's wind because there's a lot of wind here if there's wind that other branch is moving as well so we've got two blurred um, a start and an end and uh, that that makes this this whole thing so incredible because it's it, it's it is about it is about calibrating gaps it's um it is um that that gap of meditation is a really an internal gap right this this idea of kenosis and uh, and that 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 moment of letting go of of effortlessness and that and grace cannot is grace is not something you do it's really something that happens to you it's given and uh, so you, there, there must be an opening there there must be an opening and that op that gap internally must be calibrated with that external gap so there's there's two uncertainties here there's not it's these are not sharp frames as we showed them before it's not like these and uh, these gaps are actually ephemeral and 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 uh, very almost impossible to determine and it and he he uh, or she succeeds almost every time i've seen uh, squirrels fall and uh, grasp and struggle and whatever but it's very very often they succeed just like baseball players um so yes there is a there is an automatism of of the animal and there's the automatism of uh, of habit of of excessive training as you see in baseball or other sports on the other hand it's not exactly that it's not that what you do in training it's not that what you do as a as a as a as an automaton i know they're trying to build actually they're trying to build robots that can jump from one branch to another there have been lots of studies in uh, in animal kinetics and robotics uh, to actually see if it's possible to uh, 
to to build such a thing well good luck um, it's it's a uh, it's it's real pure chaos actually it's a, it's a, it's not just groundlessness in the literal sense it's really a groundlessness of uh, of everything internally as well as ec externally and the last image i want to show is just yes there are uh, cultures that are completely dedicated to to the jump um uh, here it's not a gap here it's uh, actually a 2000 pound bull that is charging at you we're in uh, we're in uh, Crete, in the, in, in the height of Minoan culture, 1500 years BC, and uh, it's well, a beautiful fresco because the, uh, that's it's quite correct. Yeah, the, the the movement of the, of the head of the bull charging at you, going down to prick you with its horns, um, <coughs> to then grab those, as you can see on the left. And then he lifts up his head and you're thrown in the air and they make a salto and they, they either land on the back of the bull or they land behind him. Uh, it seems to, um, the theory is, is actually that the, the jumping figure is female because it has a different type of skirt and a different color than, than the other figure. So it's not completely sure if it's like male or female. It's not so important for us at the moment. But there's this uh, incredible culture um, dedicated to jumping. It, this is not a sport. I mean, some some texts I read, like in German or in, in English, they, they, they talk about Stierspiele or uh, sports, but it's not sport at all. It's a, it's a ritual. It's a ceremony. It's um, it's really festivity. Only a few times per year, maybe once a year. Uh, and it's incredibly dangerous it's incredibly dangerous a lot of them got killed probably um, and and uh, that says a lot about wh what play is in Minoan culture it's um, we'll be showing a lot throughout the different lectures of Minoan culture the, the, the octopus swirling on the on the bulbous amphora for instance but uh, you, you, there's a lot of images in Minoan culture of, of actually all things floating or jumping um, monkeys and apes uh, dolphins also dolphins yeah flying fish um, even the, the swirling octopus uh, it can be a jumping underwater as much as a jumping out of the water or jumping uh, in the air and uh, that's not the point. The point is really that that, that notion of risk and, and chaos that is inherent that is that is um, inherent to the structure of the of the grace machine where the figure can only exist in this, this situation of, of, of groundlessness and this, this gap, either small or large. Um, <coughs> very important idea of of uh, of how how the the figure is constructed. That was the last slide. Thank you very much.